Hello and a warm welcome to this week's edition of Invest Africa. I'm Alicia Sekum. Well, since its independence in 1968, Mauritius has made strides from a low-income and agriculturally-based economy towards a middle-income and more diversified economy. Today, we take a closer look at the Southern African island and unpack the business challenges and opportunities it presents. Located in the Indian Ocean and covering a total surface area of just over 2,000 square kilometers, the island of Mauritius is home to roughly 1.3 million people. The Mauritian four-pillar economy, made of sugar, textile, tourism and financial services, has displayed a reasonably solid macroeconomic performance, but the country still remains fragile to the uncertainty of the global environment. Although GDP has slowed marginally to 4.1% in 2011 from 4.2% in 2010, the country presents positive growth prospects. Growth for 2012, however, is projected to grow at a rate of 4% due to subdued demand in the Eurozone. Mauritius, being a net importer of goods, created a trade deficit which further widened due to strong trade links with the European Union. Other trading partners include the USA, to which it exports textiles, sugar and fish. Import partners such as India, China and France, from where manufactured goods, equipment and petroleum are sourced. Initiatives such as the Integrated Resort Scheme, aimed towards the construction of luxury villas and golf courses, has had countries such as Great Britain, France, USA, Madagascar and Italy investing in the country's tourism sector and trapping foreign direct investment. The island of Mauritius has made a lot of progress in its campaign for social equality and poverty reduction, ranking among the above average income countries on the continent, according to the United Nations Development Programme. Although youth unemployment rate has fallen marginally to 22% in 2011 from 22.5% in 2010, it is almost three times as high as the national unemployment rate making youth unemployment a major challenge for the island of Mauritius. Well, joining us in studio now to take a closer look at Mauritius as a business and investment destination is Kemp Munich, Head of International Tax and Advisory Services at BDO, and James Ellis, who's MD of Atterbury Property Developments as well. Welcome, gentlemen, and thanks so much for joining us today. James, let's perhaps start off with you because we're all too familiar with Mauritius as an attractive tourist destination. What about its standing as an investment destination? Where does that rank in your books? Well, we decided to invest uh, in Mauritius. We are commercial property developers. Mm -hmm. And we really decided to invest in Mauritius as part of a bigger investment strategy into Africa. Um, we, we managed to, uh, to source a, a development um, in connection with local partners, mm -hmm. uh, the ENL Group, who have, have participated in a process that government uh, instituted converting sugar land into commercial real estate mm -hmm. as part of the, the ability to, to get off the dependence on sugar. And as part of that initiative, uh, the ENL Group, which is a big uh, in the sugar industry, uh, had, a, had a plot of land, 100 hectares of land, uh, seven kilometers outside of Port Louis, where they intended to do a commercial development. Mm -hmm. And uh, we managed to tie up a, a de that land together with them and develop the uh, develop the the precinct that we did. So certainly some encouragement uh, coming through for property developers in Mauritius. Uh, you've got to ask the question though, Kemp. Uh, you know where some of the features that make Mauritius a paradise island, the country's remoteness, the size, for example, where those have acted as deterrents to investment in the past. Just how much of a consideration those get paid right now for investors looking in. I think from an investor's point of view, um, it, also, it still remains issues that need to be considered, the remoteness and the smallness of the, uh, of the country. But I think looking at the, what we experience in, uh, currently is a lot of international companies use Mauritius as a springboard, I think as, as mm -hmm. James has mentioned, to get into Africa as well. And in a new budget um, document came out from Mauritius and, and they actually wanted to make that uh, work more better. Um, there's a lot of incentives going in there to go into Africa, more double tax agreements to be signed. So they really want to make it much easier from a Mauritian perspective to deal with Africa because I think there's a need, they see the need and the requirements from international companies 
to use Mauritius to go into Africa? We'll be uh, getting into the detail of Mauritius and its standing as a conduit for doing business on the rest of the continent. Uh, for now, though, let's take a look at the Mauritian growth story specifically, James. I mean, uh, just how sustainable a growth story are we looking at here? Because the insert highlighted that, uh, you know, we had growth sitting at, what, just over 4% in 2011. But the warning bells are ringing that... Uh, 3.8% growth for 2012 may not be achievable, and that due to slowing performance in the tourism sector, in the sh uh, sugar production industry, as a result of all that's going on in the global economy. Just how comfortable are you with the, the growth story that Mauritius is putting on the table? I think it needs to be recognized that Mauritius has got a, a limited economy. I mean, it's a, it's a small place, and it's got a, it's got a limited, it's got a 1.5 million person population. Mm -hmm. So I think it's unrealistic to expect that you can keep on growing and growing and growing. So we, we, we have invested. We've built a, a 40,000 square meter shopping center there. I don't think there's necessarily space for another one. However, the, the investment that we've made is trading exceptionally well. It's, a, it's something modern, it's something new, and there's nothing like it on the island. So from a commercial real estate point of view, uh, I think it's, it's about the timing. It's, uh, you know, there's certain products that the, that the island needs. And once they are there, I think there's, there's limited growth in those specific sectors going forward. Mm -hmm. However, we've got, as another phase of this development, we're doing some, some office space, as opposed to in South Africa, where we might do 20, 10, 20, 30,000 square meters at a time. We're doing it in smaller chunks, 2,000, 3,000 square meters at a time. We still believe there's a place and a market for good quality uh, real estate, yeah. commercial real estate. But I think it needs to be like, seen in the context of the size of the island. With that having been said, Kemp, uh, you, we've got to uh, draw attention to some of the other sectors on the, uh, you know, on, over in Mauritius that are drawing attention. What are some of the other investment hotspots that are certainly not as well known as that of the tourism and uh, sugar industries, for example? Um, I think to mention a few of the manufacturing, um, they're really trying to enhance incentives in manufacturing for, for companies to do manufacturing there. Also in the hospital medicine area, um, mm -hmm. there's a new bill out for, for trials and clinics that they want to, to get going. So I think that's also two of the industries we believe uh, and we see uh, when you're looking at their budget speeches and stuff that they want to encourage to come to uh, Mauritius to diversify a bit more. I think they also realize the limitations of the economy with the sugar and the tourism and they need to expand into other areas of um, business as well to, to, get, to keep going. I think that's quite important for them and they're trying to. I mean, we'll still have to see they be able to do it uh, because of remoteness, etc., and the skills shortages may be there in certain um, industries. Uh, but I think um, they're definitely trying to do uh, diversify more um, to get the economy going. Well, as Kemp's highlighted, uh, that budget speech uh, drawing emphasis to the kind of uh, uh, you know, um, commitment uh, they're, they're putting on the table from government side in incentivizing FDI. We've had uh, you know, incentives being put uh, forward in the Freeport, ICT, financial services, tertiary uh, uh, education sector, and even emerging markets like renewable energy. James, while it's all good talking about the investment incentive, I mean, it's the numbers that perhaps illustrate the appeal a little bit more definitively. And when it comes to the FDI and the kind of flow we're seeing into the country, the real estate and construction sector has accounted for, and I'm reading here, more than 40% of the total influx of FDI. I mean, the sector accounts for 19% of GDP. Just talk us through the draw cards as you see it and just how stiff competition is getting on that side. Look, I think that, that construction sector number also includes the, the RS and the RES uh, residential schemes, which have been uh, an incentive from government and I think have been uh, quite successful. Mm -hmm. You can in invest in, uh, in residential real estate there and there are a lot of benefits that, that you get by becoming an investor there. So I think that has, has uh, stimulated the construction industry to a large extent. The hotels keep growing. Um, I don't know exactly how many there are, but there are many. And if you drive around the island, you'll see the commercial uh, property development is happening uh, all over the island. We, we happen to be located in the centre, seven k's from Port Louis, so that is where most of the people are. But certainly, 
all over the island there is construction activity taking place. Well, with that activity taking place, one can only assume that the competition is stiff and that would be relevant for construction players, for developers, because it has implications for margins. The, uh, <laughs> it, the, the competition is stiff, but there are also only a limited number of, uh, of players in the industry, as, as is in any industry on, in Mauritius. Mm -hmm. So there is competition. But I think it's fairly well balanced. Kemp, let's take a closer look at the package of incentives that's provided to investors. Uh, certainly in the hotel, leisure and real estate sectors, we've got low corporate tax rate of 15%, exemption from customs and excise duties on imports of equipment and raw materials, free repatriation of profits, dividends and capitals, reduced tariffs for electricity and water as well. What do you make of mechanisms like these being used as incentive draw cards? And they effectiveness? I, I believe in, in the case of Mauritius I've, it was, it's, it's quite effective um, um, because as I said that's a springboard into Africa yeah. and where they're going with double tax agreements and the incentives they put in place to draw uh, more business into Mauritius um, th the companies do look at that and it's quite, it plays quite an important role um, they might be losing out on quite a bit of money but I think for them the way I see it is they're more interested in getting more business there and with the volumes they're going to create, hopefully with this they'll they cover the, the potential losses on taxes they might mm. might lose because of the incentives. For now at yeah, least. Uh, what now. happens down the line and uh, you know, what are the dangers to incentives like that? You know, because what if down the line out of necessity these terms need to be changed and those long-term contracts or agreements actually need to be amended? I mean certainly here in South Africa we've learned how well-intended agreements struck in the past can actually become a risk when rules change and uh, it becomes difficult for business to actually actually navigate around it? Yeah, the, the problem is that that might not be sustainable. Um, I've been there at those incentives for quite a while now, but if they don't get the volumes, it might not be sustainable, and then they have to change it or up the percentages, and that might then actually work against what they're trying to achieve. Um, so it's a, it's a risky, it's always a risk having these type of incentives. On the one hand, you try to encourage business to come, but on the other hand, the government might lose quite a bit of money, and if they don't get the volumes they, they were hoping for, um, they might, they might lose out a uh, big time and it might hurt the economy. Yeah. Uh, James, I guess for any, incent, uh, for any investor, it's really hard to ignore the fact that governments worked at making sure that uh, doing business in the country is easy, efficient, it complies with best practice. Your experience of the ease of doing business from a regulatory perspective in the country? Well, certainly our, our investment uh, program into Africa started in Mauritius and, and one of the main reasons for that was quite simply the ease of doing business mm -hmm. in Mauritius. It really is in, a, in an African context an easy place to do business. They have systems, the systems work, uh, the, the government is approachable and, and we have had no problems in, uh, in getting work done. In Mauritius. I've been reading, Kemp, that uh, you know, in addition, the government has, in the Finance Act, introduced various schemes to actually promote foreign investment with the minimum intervention from Mauritian authorities. Just how easy a feat is that to accomplish? Because worldwide, we see more so governments, African or not, becoming a lot more protectionist within the current economic environment. Um, I, I think I believe they will be able to achieve it and not getting too much involved. It, uh, as James has mentioned, the ease of business, doing business in Mauritius is, is, is quite good because if you look at the latest rankings from the World Bank, um, out of 185 economies, they're number 19, I think, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. That's so, exactly it. Uh, uh, so it's quite easy to do business there, and I think that was the success of the Mauritian government, not getting too much involved, too much red tape. Um, although you have to have a look at from a South African perspective that there's challenges when you come to the from a tax point of view from effective management point of view to make it much more difficult to to actually set up a proper business here um, and therefore th you need to take those risks into account but th we also experience to setting up companies and to doing all those um, legal requirements and get the business going, it is actually quite easy to do it. Well, let's leave the conversation there for now. At least we're heading into a quick commercial break, but there's more on Invest Africa right after this. Welcome back. You're watching Invest Africa. Well, the country's trade policies aim to make the island of Mauritius an open and globally competitive economy in order to become well integrated into the world trade system. We now take a look at how the country is positioning itself to optimize trade in Africa and around the globe. 
The Mauritian economy has reinvented itself several times over the past few decades. Each decade has been marked by new developments and industries that have made the country more diverse and helped grow the country's export base. There is a lot of watchmaking, there is a lot of jewellery, there is a lot of diamond cutting, shoes, light engineering, light plastics. So Mauritius exports over 300 product lines and to over 150 countries. Our exports uh, last year like was 40 billion rand. Out of that, 16 billion rand was goods and 24 billion rand was services. As globalization increases in Africa, the idea of special export zones has become increasingly popular. The establishment of special export zones in Mauritius is one of the country's most significant steps towards export diversification and an important part of its integration into the global economy. The whole country of Mauritius was declared an export processing zone. Not any uh, restricted fenced area, but the whole country. And it allowed a lot of manufacturing base for exports to develop. 60% of Mauritian exports are destined for Europe and given the current uncertainties in this region, Mauritius is looking to strengthen trade on the African continent by leveraging off trading blocks. Mauritius is a member of SADC, it's a member of COMESA, it's a member of the uh, Eastern African community, all of which are increasingly important regional groupings. All of these economies are growing at 5% plus as we know. Then collectively the size of these economies is much larger than Mauritius. This will not only allow the country to be an important regional player, but a strategic partner on the global stage. Dumisha Mahanyele, Johannesburg. Still with me in studio is Kemp Munich. He's Head of International Tax and Advisory Services at BDO. And James Ellis, MD of Atterbury Property Developments, with us as well. James, uh, we've largely been positive about the investment merits that Mauritius puts on the table. Where do the, the red flags get raised? What are some of the challenges that are faced that go hand in hand with investing in this country? I think from a commercial real estate point of view, the, the only red flag that I see is potential overdevelopment. We have, we have a, an economy with limited size and a limited population. It, it is growing. It is a good place to do business, but uh, I've seen it in, in other African countries where, where you see a commercial success. Somebody wants to emulate that. They come in and, and they try and redo what's been done, and ultimately you get an oversupply. And as soon as you get an oversupply, that's where, that's where you, the damage starts getting done. Mm -hmm. but, but as a country, I mean, it's stable. Uh, the currency is relatively stable. So I don't see red flags from, from my perspective other than uh, oversupply of commercial real estate. From a tax perspective, Kemp, I mean, investors and companies channel their money through countries like Mauritius to reduce tax liabilities, and that was proving, uh, you know, a bit of a challenge to be dealt with for the country. The double taxation avoidance convention, uh, you know, between Mauritius and India was put in place, for example, to try and prevent treaty abuse and create greater transparency on the exchange of uh, information on tax matters between those two countries. Uh, effectiveness of those kind of uh, policies being put in place? Yeah, I think if you look at the whole Africa continent and the way South Africa interacts on the, on, on the tax side or revenue side with other countries now is that there's definitely an emphasis on more transparency and I believe that's going to put more pressure on, on international companies, especially South African companies dealing with Africa and Mauritius. Mm -hmm. um, so it will be become more difficult to operate without being seen or trying to get um, all the loopholes going. Um, but I believe for the, from, a, from a tax perspective, South African companies got the problem that they need to put people there, they have to have proper businesses there, and that's not always viable to go and place senior people there in Mauritius itself. And I think that's a challenge for South Africa. Some African would say countries. those businesses need little incentive to let their employees go to an island. Yeah, I think it's nice for the first two weeks, and then after a few <laughs> months and after a year, you're not sitting on a beach every day, so um, it's not that great anymore, you know. So that's a challenge that African companies face at the moment, and there is much pressure from the revenue services on international transactions, on effective management. They want to go the international route, etc. So I believe that's one challenge from a tax perspective that um, definitely South African companies have to take into account when they want to use Mauritius as a route into Africa. What's your view on Mauritius as an e efficient conduit for capital, helping it flow smoothly around the world, uh, you know, challenging much needed investment onto the rest of the continent, for example? 
once again, the ease of business, there's no exchange control requirements really, so there's no withholding taxes, so all the major banks are operating there. So if you go to Mauritius, you don't go to a bank or a financial system that's not known. You actually, it's quite easy to move money around to keep your money there. It's safe. You, all the South African banks are basically operating there. So I believe from, a, from that perspective, they've got quite an advantage. Mm -hmm. Where if you look into Africa itself, most of the companies, either South Africa or international, wants to get their money out of African countries ASAP. Or there's huge restrictions, for example, in Angola to get your money out back to South Africa or to Mauritius even. So there Mauritius has got a, a huge advantage over the rest of Africa, except South Africa, that the flow of money and that could happen very easily. Yeah. There's uh, quite a focus, uh, James, on diversifying this, uh, this economy and uh, there's a very fine line between the risk this poses and the opportunity as well because uh, you know, there's a risk posed to the country's growth story if we don't see the economy diversify, but the opportunity in terms of investment areas as government increasingly you know, looks towards diversifying the economic base, uh, how are you reading that scenario as a property developer specifically because uh, one would assume that with that diversification coming through, uh, you'd have players other than hotel operators and retailers wanting to, to develop. Well, I think the, the Mauritian government realizes that land is a, is a very scarce resource. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it is limited. So I think that they have, they have done well to utilize land which was historically underutilized uh, and, and to create value and to create essentially another pillar of the, of the economy. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I think g given the size of that economy, there's, there's a limited scope. In, in, in terms of that sector. Yeah. Kemp, we've got government uh, uh, taking steps towards export diversification, and it's an important part of uh, integration into the global economy. Uh, what are you making of the success governments managed to reap so far? Um, I believe, uh, like the free trade zones, I think yeah. that's quite an important incentive um, if they can make it work. If you look at Nigeria, the Chinese government and the Lagos government have um, started the Lekki free trade zone there and a lot of companies already signed up there, for example. So a lot of companies going. I think South Africa is also considering uh, also free trade zones. Um, I know we've got some, but I think they have a bit more formal structured like they've got um, in other countries. So I think it can work. Um, and definitely from a manufacturing point of view and in an export, the free trade zones are, are very important because you, you don't have to pay duties. Um, and all those type of things that, that's in place in the free trade zone. So I think that's a that's good, good um, initiative. Um, but it, it will depend on the companies entering their free trade zones. Yeah. We've had South Africa status as a gateway to Africa for investors uh, coming under increased scrutiny over the recent past. And many have highlighted that other African countries are making stride in uh, putting themselves out there as a possible gateway to the rest of the continent. To what extent is Mauritius considered a gateway for other investors? I think that's one of the major players. Um, not, I think I believe it's one of the major players because there's either South Africa or Mauritius and there's a big competition going at the moment in, with our internationally headquartered companies regime in South Africa. They want to compete with Mauritius. Um, and another play in the markets, Botswana sometimes for different industries, they might also be a gateway into Africa. But at this point in time, I think Mauritius is the one that's giving South Africa the biggest competition of being the gateway into, South, in, into Africa. Location seems to be key as well. Mauritius yeah. centered in the global triangle of growth, linking the Middle East, Asia yes. and Africa. James, what's your outlook as far as growth for you as a property developer in Mauritius is concerned come 2030? Well, just to get back to your point of the gateway, I think that if South Africans are using Mauritius as a gateway, then it speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though South Africa is considered to be the gateway. I think we, we are operating in many countries in Africa and all of that is through Mauritius. Uh, again, on the Mauritius, on the, on the, on the island itself, um, I think that the, the, the real estate sector can grow as the population grows and as the economy grows. Mm -hmm. So I think the pace at which it grows is dictated to by that. Well, let's leave it there, gentlemen. Thanks so much for having joined us uh, today. Of course, uh, guests in studio today, Kemp Munich, head of BDO International Tax and Advisory Services, and James Ehrlers, MD of Atterbury Property Developments as well. We'll be back again at the same time in the new year. Until then, from me, Alicia Seckham, it's goodbye.